I've been working as a ranger in Harriman State Park in New York for about five years. Normally, my job entails tracking down lost hikers and busting kids with beer cans. If it's a slow day, I may just handle parking tickets or spend the afternoon at the base station. This whole summer, we'd been struggling with a boom in the black bear population. We've invested thousands of dollars in bear-proof dumpsters, hazing equipment, air horns, and training sessions for park staff. But these critters just can't stay away from our group camps and patrons. They can smell a barbecue from over a mile away, and even a spray of scented sunscreen can attract them to a camp. To make matters worse, many of our visitors don't clean up after themselves and leave their trash scattered all over the campground. Bears will dive deep into our dumpsters, break into kitchens, unlock cabinets, and sneak into outhouses. They can stand on their hind legs and climb up trees. Well, basically what I'm saying is, is that I know bears. They're mostly harmless, but if you get too close, you might be in trouble. I also know raccoons, and possums, and deer, and squirrels. I know what all the animals in this park look like and how they act. I know what I saw last week was not a normal animal. I was doing a routine drive down a park road when I noticed that the door to a camp mess hall was open and the dirt on the path was all scuffed up. Now this was odd because no one was supposed to be at this camp since the Girl Scouts left at the end of July. I figured it was either some teenagers with spray paint or maybe a maintenance worker. So I hopped out of my truck and started walking over to the cabin. As I got closer, I started to hear some weird noises. Something metal was clanking. Papers were being shuffled. It sounded like cans and boxes were falling off a shelf. Then I noticed the wet smacking sound of something eating. All right, I think to myself, okay, so I'm dealing with a bear. Or maybe a family of raccoons. So I follow protocol. I pull out my walkie-talkie so I can call for backup from the rest of my team. But the second I begin to speak, whatever it is in there must have heard me because now I hear a terrible howl from inside the cabin kitchen. I know better than to finish my call after hearing that, so I just duck down behind a tree. You gotta know I'm not so proud of this, but you know I have got a family and kids at home, and I'm glad I hid because this creature starts to walk right out the door. My first glimpse was at its legs. They looked like tree trunks and were covered with a dense, dark brown fur. This thing was huge, taller than a grown man with broad shoulders and bulging muscles. In my first look, I thought it could have been a bear. But once I saw its face, I knew it was something else. It looked like a man in some ways, or maybe a gorilla, or maybe a wolf. Whatever it was, it wasn't a bear. I know it couldn't have been. Its face was hairless and its forehead was protruding out it looked mad. This thing walked right on out of the mess hall on two legs. It peered at my truck on the road, sniffed up into the air, swung its long arms and ran. I tried to peer out to see where it went, but it was too fast. In a blink, it was gone. I dusted off my pants and finished calling my team. When they arrived at the camp, I started to tell them about what I'd seen. Everyone kept laughing at me and saying, oh, well, of course, Kyle saw Bigfoot, huh? No one wanted to believe me. But once we walked into the kitchen, they started to change their tune. The first thing that hit us was the smell. It was like we walked into a garbage dump that had been set on fire, and that fire was put out with skunk spray. I held my shirt up over my nose, but my pal David actually threw up once that stench hit him. Yep, true story there. The room was nearly destroyed. The refrigerator was flung open, and the contents were spilled all over the floor. Serves that camp right for leaving so much food in the cabin over winter, but bears can't open jars. They can't open cans. They can't smash open locked cabinets. All along the walls were scratch marks, and the whole place was a mess. It was a terrible sight. The floor was covered in a layer of pasta sauce, relish, and marshmallows. There was a loaf of bread with a huge bite missing out of it, right through the plastic. I picked it up off the counter, and then I immediately flung it back down. My fingers were covered in a sticky slobber, and I couldn't wipe it off quickly enough. 
In the mess of mustard and ketchup and spoiled milk on the floor, I could actually make out a full footprint. It looked like a normal man's foot in all the gunk, but it was three times as large as my shoe, and I'm a size 11. I think I really did see Bigfoot, or the Yeti, or whatever you want to call it. I know what I saw. It wasn't a bear. We're not going to patrol as solo anymore. Everyone is sticking with their partner. I think that we're better safe than sorry. That thing could take any of us, though. Even the bigger guys wouldn't stand a chance. My grandmother, a full-blooded Cree Indian, raised me and my sister. We lived near Hiawatha National Forest, which is part of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Her family was from Canada, but I never got to meet my great-grandparents. From the time I was small, I remember her telling us girls that if we argued with each other too much, the Wendigo would steal our souls. Now, I understand parents and grandparents will say all sorts of things to get kids to behave, but this was different. We knew there was a Wendigo in the woods nearby. Sometimes when we were picking berries, my grandmother would take us out to a stone wall at the edge of the property and tell us to never, ever go past that boundary. The Wendigo had claimed that property, and if we respected his boundary, he would respect ours. She told us the Wendigo was a terrible creature, a monster who ate the flesh of humans. She said he smelled like a dead deer and stood seven feet tall. But the most important thing she said was, there was a covenant with the Cree people and the Wendigo, which meant he was bound to respect our borders, or fire would consume him from the inside out. Because of our heritage, we grew up with certain customs. When we had a plentiful harvest, my grandmother would pack a basket full of excess fruit or vegetables and leave it on top of the stone wall. She said the Wendigo would come and take it at night. I guess it was an offering, a reminder that we had a covenant. I was 12 years old before I ever saw it for myself. My sister was a year older than me and we were arguing constantly at that age. Nothing my grandmother could say would convince us to get along. Then, on Valentine's Day that year, I got really angry. My sister came home with a box of chocolates from a boy I had a crush on. We got in a big fight and my grandmother sided with my sister. She told me to take my bad attitude up to my room without supper. I stewed about it for hours, scowling at my sister's empty bed and looking out the window at the moon. After a while, I got in my bed, but I was too angry to sleep. I was awake when my sister came in, and then I heard my grandmother go into her room and close her door. I waited, forming a plan born of spite. Once my sister's breathing was steady and even, I tiptoed over to her nightstand and stole the box of candy. I eased down the steps and put on my coat and my boots and let myself silently out the door. I remember it was a beautiful starry night. There was only a few inches of snow and it glittered under the moon. I crunched across the yard, clutching the stolen candy box and not allowing myself to think twice. Once I was in the woods, though, I started to get nervous. I stopped and listened, thinking I heard something crunching through the snow behind me. I looked but didn't see anything, so I walked on until I got to the stone wall. I crept up as quiet as I could be, which was not very quiet with boots in snow. I laid the candy box on the stone wall and walked away, a mean little glow of victory spreading in my misguided heart. Ha! Let the Wendigo eat her chocolates, I thought. And then I heard something terrible. A fierce growl, unlike any animal I'd ever heard. I slipped behind a tree feeling entirely too exposed out there in the snow, like a target in my bright red coat. I listened, barely breathing, and suddenly I smelled a foul odor. It was the smell of death. I knew the Wendigo was nearby. My heart started pounding so hard, I was afraid the creature would hear it and find me. I wanted to run, but I didn't dare move out from behind the tree. I heard the snow crunch nearby, and a snuffling sound like a bear makes. I was so terrified my teeth were chattering, but I had to look. Slowly, carefully, I peeked around the side of the tree, praying it wouldn't see me. It was there standing on the other side of the stone wall, just as my grandmother had described it. 
hugely tall and powerful looking, standing up on two legs and covered in fur, all except for its head. The moonlight shone down on its head, and my breath caught in my throat when I saw the naked skull it had for a face, glowing red embers for eyes and terrible, wicked antlers protruding from its skull. This is embarrassing to admit, but I was only twelve after all. Seeing that monstrous creature only twenty paces or so away from me, I lost control of my bladder. Immediately the thing turned its head, looking right at the tree I was hiding behind, and I knew it could smell me. I squeezed my eyes shut, feeling lightheaded and dizzy. I knew I was about to faint for real. My grandmother saved me. A bright light shone through the woods, and I could hear her voice shouting my name. I was too afraid to speak, but I opened my eyes and saw the Wendigo turn its head, looking in her direction. With an angry snort through its nostrils, it stalked off into the woods. I huddled there against the tree, crying, still too afraid to move, and that's where my grandmother found me. I blubbered out my crime to her, expecting her to take a strap to me. She didn't, though. Maybe she thought I'd learned my lesson. She scolded me harshly and had me do my sister's chores for a week. I also had to apologize and spend my allowance to buy my sister a new box of candy. And the stolen box of chocolates? It was gone. Maybe the Wendigo took it, or maybe it knocked it all into the snow on the other side of the wall. I don't know. I never went back there looking for it. But I do remember as I confessed my shameful behavior, standing in the snow, my grandmother shone her light on the wall, and the box was gone. So if you're a disbeliever, know this. Just because you personally haven't seen a Wendigo doesn't mean they don't exist. There's plenty of us who have seen them. I got something interesting for you that still stumps me to this day. I love watching shows about the supernatural and am very intrigued by it, but haven't had too many experiences myself. This one experience really freaked me out though, so I'm not sure if I want another one. But at the same time, it does make life more interesting. I mean, there is so much out there that we will never know or fully understand. I'm a correctional officer and I've seen some crazy things in the prison. I'm sure you and your listeners can only imagine some of the stuff we see. We got this inmate a little while ago who was charged with rape and murder. He also had a track record of multiple counts of burglary and breaking and entering charges. Basically, he had an entire gamut of charges against him. But honestly, I never had too many issues with him. He was good at doing time and mostly kept to himself. He was a model inmate for most of his stay. Didn't cause any problems, didn't fight with any other inmates, and always treated me with respect. Then one day, a fellow officer barged into where I was doing paperwork and told me I had to see something immediately. We went up to this guy's cell, and his face had completely changed. He was snarling and drooling, and he had this evil smile on his face. Then he screamed, no, and appeared to be fighting something inside himself. Finally, after squirming around the floor for a while, he returned to normal, apologized, got into bed, and didn't make a sound for as long as we stood there. The heckles and taunts were coming in from the nearby cells, but nothing made him stir. After this, I always looked at that guy differently, and always had my guard up a bit, but he went right back to displaying perfectly normal behavior. I didn't have any incidents with this guy for about a week, until one night, I was walking by his cell and saw him writhing around on the floor again. His face had completely changed once again, but it was different from the face I saw the last time. This really freaked me out. Does this guy get possessed by a different demon every week or something? Eventually, he regained his composure, apologized, and got back into bed. This became a regular occurrence, and about once a week, a different demonic smile would greet me from the bars of his cell. I asked him about it to see if he had ever been treated for this psychological condition of his, and he told me that the affliction he suffered from couldn't be treated by medicine. He said that it had been happening to him since he was a child, and it was something he's always struggled with. He said that before, the demons would take over for days and sometimes weeks at a time. But now he was spiritually stronger and could defeat them much quicker. I told him to keep fighting the good fight, and went on about my day. 
Now, this same prisoner would regularly visit the prison chaplain and was always kind, cooperative, and grateful to him. But shortly after his visits with the chaplain, another demon would try to take over his body. It was almost like the visits to the chaplain encouraged the demonic activity. One time I watched him having a fit, and the face that looked back at me had completely black eyes and a huge mouth. If this guy was just messing with us, he was a genius actor, but I believe him that he has demonic encounters. The faces this guy makes are enough to give anyone nightmares. Then once day when I was on my rounds, he didn't respond to me when I called his name. I suspected he was trying something shifty, so I called a couple of other officers in to help me investigate. Together we unlocked and entered the cell. He was laying on his bed facing the wall. I kept saying his name without any response, so I finally reached over and rolled him over. His face was frozen in one of his horrific faces. A smile with black eyes, and he was dead. I didn't show my fear to the other officers, but this shook me up. I started going to visit the prison chaplain myself to cover all my spiritual bases just in case. I told the chaplain all about it and I think, in order to help me feel better, the chaplain shared with me that he too had recently started having these fits. Fits where he'd black out and wake up hours later and find himself someplace else. I asked him if it could be the same thing that the inmate suffered from, but he told me he felt it was just migraines. Then one day I saw the chaplain and I didn't recognize him at all. He was just sitting on the pew with this huge, unnatural smile on his face. I cautiously said hello to him and he just looked at me silently with that smile. It was enough to make me continue on my way and get out of there. Then I overheard some of the inmates talking one day and they mentioned that since they started going to the chaplain, they started having intense headaches. I made a note to keep my eye on them and went about my day. Then one day, the chaplain quit suddenly and we had to scramble to find a replacement. The new chaplain was very nice but I often wonder what happened to the man who left. I couldn't help but hope that the demons in his head didn't get the best of him. Since then, I've moved and am working security at a shopping mall, and it's a much more chill job than the prison. I haven't had any paranormal experiences since, but those black eyes and smiles still stick with me. Even if that inmate was a terrible human being, what a miserable way to die. It makes me wonder how many people are walking around possessed by something they can't control. He can't be the only one, can he? If anyone has dealt with possessions before, please let me know how you dealt with them. Should we have called an exorcist into the prison? Would it have gone away if he had seen the psychiatrist? These questions keep me up some nights. And believe it or not, of all the crazy things I had to deal with at the prison, that death weighs the heaviest on. I've lived in a small house in the middle of the woods for a long time now. There are all sorts of wildlife that I get to see every day that I never used to see when I was a child. It's so stimulating, and it reminds me of how vast and infinite the universe is daily. I do believe, however, that I would have seen a lot more wildlife and might also be dead if I didn't have a paranormal protector who looks after me. I know that sounds crazy, but check this out. One night shortly after I had moved in, a wolf was on the porch sniffing around and checking things out. I was freaked out and I peered out from the window waiting for him to leave. The wolf saw me, froze, and started growling at me. I didn't know what to do. All of a sudden it jumped up and snapped at the window, snarling viciously. It kept jumping up and trying to bite me through the closed window. A couple more times and he would have shattered the glass. Then all of the sudden I heard the wolf whimper like it had been hurt and it ran off. I opened the front door and it was nowhere to be found. I went back inside and perched upside down by the window was a bat. It was obvious that I was going to have a lot of encounters with the surrounding wildlife living here. After that, the bat would perch by my window and look in at me every night around 8 o'clock or so. It got to the point that I would look forward to his visit and even started to prepare food and water for him. I built him a bat box that he could sleep in and pretty soon that became his permanent home. All night he would flutter around eating insects and return to the window to look at me. 
I swear this bat is in love with me. When I look into his eyes, I can see him relax and settle there by the window. He is very protective of me, and any time anything gets close to the window, he flies around threateningly and scares it off. He's even done it with some friends and family I've had over. My mom tells me to get rid of him, but I honestly love having him there. I don't know for sure if the wolf would have broken through the window and killed me, but it's possible that this bat saved my life. He's my guardian angel perched by the window, letting me know I'm safe every night. A couple of months later, a family of bears was roaming around the property, and a big one came up on the front porch and started sniffing around. I slammed on the door and yelled loudly to scare it off, and it ran off towards the other bears. Then all three of them just stopped and stared at the house. I kept yelling and pounding on the door, trying to get them to run away, but they just kept staring. Then all of the sudden they just charged at the house and started roaring. One jumped up and pounded on the door, the other one bashed the window in, and another one ran around the side. I immediately ran into the bedroom, locked the door, and called 911. I alerted the operator of what was going on, and he said that help was on the way. I heard the bears roaring and breaking things, and then all of a sudden I heard them whimpering. There was silence shortly afterward. I waited a couple of minutes and opened the door. The house was a wreck, and a bear was lying in the middle of the living room in a pool of blood. I slowly walked over to it and noticed a huge gash on the neck. The bear was dead and bleeding all over the place. I opened the front door and looked around for the other two bears, but they were nowhere to be found. The police came shortly after that and found the other bears dead in the woods nearby with neck wounds. The officer said it was a bite and it was most likely the same animal that killed all bears. They told me I was extremely lucky and that I should get a shotgun to defend myself in the future. Shortly after they left, the bat perched by the window and looked in at me. It seemed impossible, but I couldn't help but feel that the bat had saved my life again. If it wasn't my supernatural protector, then what else could have taken on three bears? I feed the bat insects, fruit, and the occasional baby mouse, and every night he looks in on me. I know his secret, though. He's not just a bat. He's my protective vampire, and nothing anyone says will convince me otherwise. I hope one day he will reveal his true form to me and trust that I will keep his secret. But until then, I will keep taking care of the bat that loves and protects me. Does anybody know of a way to get a vampire to reveal itself? I've got to admit, I really didn't want to talk about this. But maybe it's time I get this all out. So this all started during my friend Deanna's bachelorette party. We'd all decided to surprise her with a beach trip over at the Jersey Shore. It was all just cute girly stuff that we'd been planning for like months. Matching ribbons, pink wine glasses, and selfie props. But it wasn't. We'd been partying on the beach all day, and when we got back to the Airbnb, we remembered we'd left a cooler down on the beach, so I volunteered to run out and grab it. I was walking with my phone flashlight, but basically everything was pitch black. I saw a beam of light out in the distance on the ocean. Like sort of like a police helicopter beam, you know? I thought it was odd, but I kept making my way down the beach. Then I saw it, just like this disgusting figure staring back at me. At first I thought it was a man, but there was something deeply wrong with it. It was too tall, too skinny, its head was too big, its body was frail, and its eyes were a deep black. There was something behind those eyes, and I felt them sort of pull me. Even though I knew better, there was something about it that drew me closer. I just kept on walking closer and closer. Soon enough, I was around 15 feet from this thing. The skin was smooth, like a dolphin, but with bulging veins all over. At the end of its skinny arms were long, thin fingers that wouldn't stop moving. They looked like jellyfish tentacles. If it weren't for that massive head, it would almost look human, although someone extremely malnourished with knobby knees. Soon enough, I was only 10 feet away and I realized that this thing had no mouth or nose, just an empty space where they should be. All this time, those deep black eyes were deadlocked straight on me. 
I felt a ringing in my ears that began to grow sharper and louder with each step forward. The sound vibrated in my skull and surrounded me completely. It started to turn into a low hum. The figure began to vibrate a bit as well and I couldn't look away from those piercing eyes. Even though I was initially scared and confused, the sound started to calm me. It sounded like a terrifying lullaby, and I felt hypnotized as I crept closer and closer. Suddenly, a bright white light began to shine down from the sky. It blinded me for a moment, so I bent down and covered my eyes with my hands. After the initial shock of the white flare, I peered out from my fingers. The creature was gone, and the beach was pitch black yet again. I used my phone flashlight one more time to scan the area, but I couldn't see anything besides the sand, the dunes, and the steadily rolling waves. I took a deep breath and immediately regretted it. There was a strong stench, almost like rotting eggs and mulch. I couldn't see anything that could have caused this smell, so I think it could have been from the thing I saw. Once I regained my composure, I turned around and walked back to the Airbnb. The girls asked me what took me so long and why I didn't grab the cooler, but I just needed to go to my room and be alone. They told me I'd been gone for over an hour and had been walking up and down the beach looking for me. It only felt like a few moments out on that beach, and I definitely didn't hear or see anyone else out there. I couldn't sleep that night. I sat there staring at the ceiling the entire night, and in the morning, I decided to leave the girls' trip early to head home. My friends were sad to see me go, but I just couldn't explain what I'd seen without sounding crazy. I wanted to just forget about the creature. I wanted to just leave it on the beach and carry on like normal, but every time I closed my eyes to go to sleep, all I could see were those black eyes peering back at me. A few times I woke up sweating as I was shaken by a piercing hum. This carried on for a full week and then one night, it just stopped. It took me another few weeks to really acknowledge what I had seen, but eventually I began a deep dive on Google to try to figure out what it could have been. After reading about a thousand blog posts, a hundred wiki threads, and a million dead ends, I came to terms with the fact that I'd seen an alien. There have been a few sightings here on the East Coast, especially on the shore. That bright beam of light must have been its ship. I'm thinking of going back down to the beach. I'm not scared. The longer I think about it, the more certain I am that there are more of its kind out there and more coming.